Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. And in February 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm 80 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia. I've been on a ketogenic diet since April of 2014. And when I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've lost about 100 pounds and completely turned my health around. And this shows a document of our experiences thriving for years in nutritional ketosis. Yeah, and reversing type 2 diabetes. Booyah! And hopefully <laughs> that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, we're not doctors. We don't want to give out any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we don't have a favorite little technical detail, are we, Carl? No be a big negatory nope we just check it into our code repository <laughs> <laughs> we we have done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind them we share studies that we found in the show notes you'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies yep we love to cook and mm. we love to eat and yeah. every episode we both share an awesome keto recipe so you don't want to miss that <laughs> So, buddy, let's start podcast number 147. Sam Feltham, the man who ate 6,000 calories a day for a month and lost weight. Could you save your due for a little? So, Richard, do we have any apologies or corrections from last week's show? Let's see. Last week was 146, What the Fat with Grant Schofield. No, I don't think we have had any corrections for that. Uh, Grant did a wonderful job, as always. So, yep. uh, thank you very much, Grant. All right. Well, let's revisit what a ketogenic diet is. That's mm -hmm. any diet that puts you into a state of ketosis where you're burning fat for energy rather than glucose. Yep. And one surefire way to do that is to restrict your carbohydrate intake to 20 grams or less a day. And you basically don't want any sugar, any starch, no fruit, yeah. nothing like potatoes or pasta or bread. Yeah, no beer. <laughs> yeah, all of your carbohydrates should be complex carbohydrates that you get from things like green leafy vegetables, nuts, eggs, heavy cream, that kind of thing. Cheese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, protein is moderate, and we used one to one and a half grams per day for every kilogram of lean body mass we have. Mm -hmm. For Richard and I, it's about 80 to 100 grams of protein a day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And all of our energy we get from fat. fat. Either the fat on our plate or the fat from that Krispy Kreme that we ate a decade ago. Yeah. And if you're just starting the ketogenic diet, listen to our starting keto show at start. Dot two keto dot com or you know what just start with episode one yeah <laughs> <laughs> so richard how was your week um let's see i've had a good week I, of course i finished school i've got all my results in and now mm -hmm. i'm getting ready for christmas and then uh getting ready for school for next year it's going to be a big year for me so i noticed actually a study came out recently and this came out of perth and uh, some of my friends are actually subjects in the study uh, mm -hmm. and it was a study of people who are on paleolithic diet uh, which is, you know, this is essentially a real food diet. Some people have uh, some carbohydrates like uh, sweet potatoes and dates and honey mm -hmm. and things like that. But for the most part, it's a lowish carbohydrate diet. But yeah. it's mostly no grains and uh, no sugars. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's on the low carb end of the spectrum. Right. And this study showed that people on paleo diets have higher levels of TMAO than people on balanced diets. And this TMAO is, uh, it's actually, it's made by our gut biome from the food that we eat. It's hmm. uh, a, a chemical called trimethylamine enoxide. And it's a breakdown product of uh, breaking down either carnitine from meat or choline from eggs or lecithin. Mm -hmm. There's a few things that we eat in our diet that are broken down to make this TM. Uh, AO. Okay. And um, the reason this is a problem is there was a study published in 2013 assessing 513 adults with a history of major adverse cardiovascular events. So these are people who are sick and have cardiovascular disease. Right. Um, and they had an average age of 68 and 69% of them uh, were smokers. <laughs> so, oh. you know, this is not a very healthy group that you're looking at. And right. this study saw an association between high levels of TMAO in the blood uh, and an increased risk of additional cardiovascular events. So those people who had higher TMAO 
had had more more heart disease. But this this was a very sick group of people. Sounds like a no brainer slam dunk, doesn't it? Uh, well, well, you'd think so, but no, not <laughs> really. Uh, see, one of the problems is you know what also causes high levels of TMO fish fish. <laughs> and, yeah, and guess what? A diet rich in fish is seen as associated with less cardiovascular less disease. Cardiovascular <laughs> disease, of course, right. it is. Yeah, so, you know, it's more shoddy biomarker science. Um, yep. And I, I've decided what I'm going to do this year is I'm going to uh, work on a video series and a blog at a astudysays.com investigating <laughs> bad science journalism and drilling into studies to see what they really show. So the idea is when you're on Facebook and you see a headline that says, fresh health warnings issued over controversial paleo diet after heart disease link discovered, yeah, ooh. <laughs> we'll, we'll be able to look into what the actual science says. And uh, when some vegan keyboard warrior on Facebook gins, gives you a link to a study shows, you can send them back a copy of my video on the subject. Awesome. I love that. So that's my week. Yeah. So I'm, I'm setting up a TV studio in my office and uh, I've got a green screen. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it really professionally. So uh, hopefully this will be uh, something useful I can do with my biochemistry degree. That's, that's amazing. And you're just the perfect person to do that as well. Well, I, I'm going to be tuning into every episode. Excellent. So, how was your week, Carl? Huh? It was really good. I did another successful local keto meetup. Nice. At RD86 last night. RD86, mm -hmm. of course, is where uh, it was sort of like the food central of, uh, of Keto Fest. Keto Fest, yeah. For the whole weekend. Mm. And um, I basically got to ketify their regular menu. Oh, I tell you what, when Robert ketos any food, I mean, he makes delicious foods as it is. This yeah. is uh, yeah, uh, uh, Chef Robert at uh, RD86. But mm. when he goes keto, he just steps it up a notch. Yep. Spectacular. So basically, <laughs> they gave me um, a Google Doc, which is their regular menu that they had made a copy mm -hmm. of and said, here, go to town. You know, take okay. out all the sugar and starch. So, mm -hmm. sitting down with Robert, basically, we had uh, several appetizers. Um, the French onion soup just didn't have the crostini in it. And actually, Julie from Fox Hill Kitchen sent down a bunch of buns. So, they nice. took a half a bun and toasted it and made that the mm. crostini. Perfect. Yep. Um, mm. We had seafood chapino, mm -hmm. uh, which is a sort of a... Like a, a stew almost. Okay. And, you know, it's got clams and mussels and shrimp and scallops. Mm. And it's in a, a kind of a spicy tomato-based broth. Is it like a bouillabaisse base sort of thing? A sort of, yeah. It's like from fish mm. stock with some tomato yeah. paste and, and, sure. and flavors. Mm -hmm. And I basically told Robert, I said, here's how you ketify that sauce. Make it half butter. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, boom, <laughs> done. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> He dropped the microphone. <laughs> yeah, it was just amazing. So, he also does a New York strip, and mm, that's pretty nice. much keto anyway. Yeah. His sides yeah. are Brussels sprouts with bacon and bacon fat and yep. some nuts and things. It's just delicious. Mm -hmm. So, uh, also, he did a pork chop with a huge fat cap, big, thick pork chop, sous vide. Mm. So, the pork chop was in a sous vide bath, a medium rare for a couple hours. And then they finished it on the grill. Mm, nice. And, you know, butter, rosemary sauce, and, oh, man, unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, also, a bacon blue cheeseburger on Fox Hill Kitchen's buns. Nice. So, this was great, too, because it was, he started with 80-20, you know, beef burgers mm -hmm. and that were seasoned inside and then, um, you know, cooked them in butter and <laughs> the, the blue cheese sauce was basically blue cheese, butter, and heavy cream. And mm -hmm. just thickened up, and that was poured mm -hmm. over the top. Mm. OMG. So, basically, Chef Robert has agreed to keep a keto menu at all times. Nice. Uh, we made my coleslaw. So, mm -hmm. Carl's coleslaw is on the menu. Yeah, well. And and this keto menu at RD86 is something I've been looking forward to for a long time. Mm. And, you know, Chef is like, you know, most of our stuff is keto already. But, you know, there's something really liberating about being handed a keto menu. Because you know everything is okay on that menu. You don't have to scrutinize every ingredient. Yeah, Carl, that's awesome. So, you were able to take somebody who was a, a restaurant that was delivering just good food and mm -hmm. show them how to tweak it so that people who, you know, diners who are keto would know that this is ketogenic food. That's exactly right. So, that's a service that you could actually offer to other restaurants, right? 
Oh, and I do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I've done it with another restaurant. And if anybody has a restaurant out there or knows of a restaurant that wants to get on the keto bandwagon, doesn't quite know what to do with their dishes, they can contact me directly at uh, dudes at twoketodudes.com or nice. carl at franklins.net. Is another Excellent. Way. Yeah. That's it. Mm-hmm. So we also started an Amazon store. Mm-hmm. And an Amazon store is something you can do if you have, if you're an influencer and you have a certain number of uh, Instagram followers or Twitter followers or something. And then mm-hmm. you can basically take products that you like and put them in your store. And then when people buy from your store, you know, we get a little bit of uh, residual from that. Sure. And so this is just a, a way that we can kill two birds with one stone we can you know make a little money for the podcast and mm-hmm. we can offer up all the things that we like on amazon and you can support us just by buying them from that page there's no extra cost to you nice so if you go to amazon.2keto.com you can check out the things that we have up there mm-hmm. and we're always adding to it and if you have something you want us to add you can email us at dudes at keto.com nice also we have some great changes afoot Some big changes, which we will tell everyone next week on the Holiday Hangout Show. Yeah. We're going to have that show with a lot of our podcasters who've uh, worked with us this year, um, Mm -hmm. including Daisy Brackenhall from uh, Keto Woman Podcast. Yep. Mark Miller and Karen Mangiacotti from the Keto Families and Keto Kids Podcast. Yeah. Megan Ramos and uh, Brenda Zorn from uh, the Obesity Code Podcast. That's right. And IDM. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. Louise Reynolds, of course. She's our third keto dude. A third keto dude, mm-hmm. Brandon Wen, our super audio wizard, and a special mystery guest. Yeah. Um, you'll have to tune in to find out who. And Kim yeah. Howerton would have been on the show, but the scheduled recording time was way too early in the morning for her. Hey, it's 3 a.m. in Australia right now. If that's not I early, know. I don't know what is. <laughs> that's true. Well, you know, that's the problem when you have 10 people dialing in from every corner of the world. Yeah. Someone's bound to be asleep or should yeah. be asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Which was me yesterday, but yeah, let's not talk about that. <laughs> yeah, right. All right, let's give away some swag. Sure. Every show, we pick a lucky winner at random from the members of the Two Kid Dudes fan club. And today, we're giving away a treasure trove of stuff from vendors we like, all of which you can find at fanclub.2keto.com. We also need to mention a caveat. Most of our vendors can only ship inside the U.S. That's right. But if we happen to pick someone outside the U.S., we'll find something to send you, but it probably won't be everything. Yeah. So, who's our winner this week? Today's winner is Brad Doles. Congratulations, Brad. Let's tell everybody what Brad has won. Sure. Well, the first thing we're giving Brad is a two Keto Dudes coffee mug with our mugs on it that says, keep calm (laughs) and keto on. That's good advice. (laughs) We're also giving away a signed copy of Lies My Doctor Told Me by Dr. Ken Berry online at lies.2keto.com. And a bottle of Stevia Sweet Barbecue Sauce developed by a barbecue restaurant owner who plans to change the industry forever. Just two carbs per serving online at steviasweetbbq.com. And a cheese-making kit from Wine & Way. Pam Zorn gave everybody at Keto Fest a kit so they can make their own fresh mozzarella. That's available online at wineandway.com. That's W-I-N-E-A-N-D-W-H-E-Y.com. And a six-ounce cup of beef bone broth concentrate from Birthright Nutrition. Just add water, heat, stir, sip, and enjoy. Jam-packed with good stuff. More at birthrightnutrition.com. We're also giving away a bottle of Remag Magnesium Solution developed by Dr. Carolyn Dean, along with a copy of her protocol and the Keto and Magnesium Manifesto, online at magmiracle.com. We're also giving away a big bottle of Fasting Drops from Keto Chow. It's a well-formulated blend of electrolytes. Just drop a little in your water and fasting will be a breeze. Online at fastingdrops.2keto.com. And two bottles of Sated, one chocolate, one vanilla, online at sated.2keto.com. And finally, a bag of everything bagels from Fox Hill Kitchens, made with yeast but no wheat or gluten, online at bread.2keto.com. And if you don't want to wait to win some swag, you can buy all sorts of it online at gear.2keto.com. Yes! All right, man, I think I'm going to read this. What am I going to read? It's uh, <laughs> the thing, what is it? No! <laughs> oh man it's funny all right i'll go first sure so this is an email we got from archie mm-hmm. and archie says and he's an older gentleman but he says mm-hmm. i can sum up my experience in six key 
quotes. Okay. A giant sneeze gave me esophageal cancer. Wow. It was September 2013. I was cooking and the effort to block the sneeze caused all the muscles in my back to lock up, resulting in a terrible bout of lumbago. Oh. Yeah. It was so bad that the osteopath could do nothing, sending me to my GP for anti-inflammatories. The side effect of those was gastroesophageal reflux, which persisted for months and gave me more and more trouble swallowing. Ugh. Thinking it was an infection, I tried a three-day water fast, which didn't help. Mm -hmm. An endoscopy at the end of July 2014 revealed that the obstruction was squamous cell carcinoma. Ooh, ouch. Yeah. The first quote, the gastric surgeon told me, quote, you'll be eating a lot of ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, this guy's never heard of Otto Warburg. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> I agreed to minimal chemo and radiotherapy to prepare me for surgery, resolving privately to add at least a ketogenic diet to that. Mm. And my wife was superb, preparing foods I could swallow, inventing terrific soups, food processing stews, selecting cheeses, making guacamole. Mm, yeah. Um, picking pate and stuff, <laughs> I owe my survival to her efforts. I added three cups of green tea every day to counter angiogenesis mm -hmm. and as much turmeric as I could mix into all of our food as it's renowned for its anti-cancer properties. After the chemo and radiotherapy, I often found food getting stuck for up to 48 hours. Tough when you're hungry and thirsty. Yeah. I told the radiation oncologist, quote, I'm following a ketogenic diet. I've read accounts by a lot of survivors who did that. Second quote, the ones who tried a ketogenic diet and died never wrote anything. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh, man. The gastric surgeon told me, the good news is we can operate on you. The treatment has worked exceptionally well. The tumor has shrunk hugely. Nice. <laughs> yeah. And I asked... And what if the surgery proves unnecessary? Quote number three. He growled, don't kid yourself. Esophageal cancer always requires surgery. Hmm. The proposed surgery was brutal, involving chopping out the lower third of my esophagus and the top corner of my stomach, then stitching Ugh. the two together. It would have left me with reflux for life. Yeah. You'd lose a sphincter at the top of the stomach. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Not a good idea, I thought. Due to a mix-up with the next scan, I canceled the surgery. Then the hospital lost me. Hmm. Only a couple months later did I get the results of the scan and arranged to see the oncologist again. Fourth quote. You've only done half the treatment. Hmm. <laughs> I suggested a further round of tests now seven months after diagnosis and five months after the last treatment. The results were all negative. 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 Nice. <laughs> Negative. The oncologist then gave me my fifth quote. You're as stubborn as a mule. <laughs> I asked him if I had been wrong and he replied, no. <laughs> <laughs> In July 2015, after yet more tests, he gave me my final quote. I don't like to go there, but you're cured. Wow. They don't say that very often, do they? No, no. I've been having tests every six months since then, which have all proved negative. I continue to eat pretty strict keto as I enjoy it, and I don't want to feed up any stray cancer cells. I gave a slightly edited version of my story as a presentation at the Rethinking Cancer International Conference in Paris in September 2017, mm -hmm. where I had the pleasure of meeting Professor Thomas Seyfried, nice. who was delighted by my account. Several other well-known cancer experts were there. Walter Longo was there, mm. but he had no time for the likes of me. Oh. And then again, I have no time for the likes of him. No. <laughs> <laughs> At least many points of view were expressed, which has to be a good thing. Thanks for the great show. All the best, Archie. Wow. That, now, we should unpick that a little bit. Now, yeah. Thomas Seyfried was a guest on our show, and you should go back and listen to that if you're interested in his theory, his hypothesis mm -hmm. about uh, about a metabolic uh, cause of cancer. Mm -hmm. And some of the things he says are controversial, but some of the things he says, pretty much nobody could could uh, could fail to follow the evidence uh, mm -hmm. to see that our current understanding of uh, a genetic uh, cause of cancer has a lot of holes in it. There are a lot of yeah. things we don't know about it. 
But when yeah. he mentioned Otto Warburg, Otto Warburg was a guy, a German, a German biochemist who um, won the Nobel Prize for um, for a bunch of things. But one of the things he discovered was that cancer cells live predominantly on glucose. And you should listen yeah. to Thomas Seyfried, uh, Professor Seyfried's uh, uh, show to, to learn more about that. Um, yep. But we don't know that a ketogenic diet has uh, reduced his uh, disease. We don't know that the turmeric helped. We don't know that the green tea right. helped or any of this. But w- what we do know is that he's cured. And right. those were all of the things that he did. So for right. him, that probably helped. At least it didn't hurt. So uh, it certainly didn't make his cancer worse. So yeah. if you have cancer, it's worth listening to Thomas Seyfried's show and reading the book, uh, Tripping Over the Truth, and take that to your oncologist and uh, talk to them about it because, uh, um, you know, y- y- you never know when, uh, when you know, a, a dietary uh, intervention may make a significant change in your uh prognosis and here's the thing kids it's just food yeah that's right it's just food all right that's what i got what do you got so i've actually got one that came from a guest to the national press club in canberra australia and Mm. uh so as you know uh the national press club hosted our ketogenic uh uh, keto fest fest. in canberra and uh this was our first keto fest outside of the usa uh, yep. We can now legitimately say that Keto Fest is an international conference. <laughs> That's right. So the chef, we met Darren, the sh- Darren Tetley, the chef, uh, the executive yep. chef at the at the uh, at the National Press Club in Canberra, um, and it, essentially we cooked with the entire team, and they cooked the meals that we showed people how to make, uh, right. and it, it was a pretty good meal, right? So yeah, it was amazing. So they know about keto. So anyway. They had uh, a person send them a, a random email after a degustation, and this person basically said, uh, when you go to the, the press club, you can tell them what your dietary requirements are. So if you're vegan, you can say, I, I need a vegan meal. And if you give them enough notice, they'll, they'll make sure that the meal meets your requirements. And you, you right. know, it could be gluten-free or it could be you know seafood. You know, they, all of these things chefs have to worry about. Well, somebody sent... Uh, a, a letter to the chef saying, is it possible to get a ketogenic meal? And of course, <laughs> we'd just done Keto Fest. And so the chef <laughs> said, yeah, no worries. And so uh, this is the email. The email says, uh, please let the chef know that my friend and I were blown away by the meal last night. And I'm so impressed that you catered to my no dairy, no grain, no sugar needs. I think my girlfriend was jealous of my meal. Yeah. She's half indigenous. And she said that my meal was probably closer to the real thing than hers without sugar. <laughs> wow. Given how amazing the meal and the experience and the service was, I would suggest that you have a ketogenic meal as an option always. I know quite a few people doing the no sugar, no grain thing, except with keto, it's no carb, which kills potatoes and sweet potatoes. Once again, I just wanted to say the meal was amazing. I loved it. Thank you. Wow. Great. So there you go. Yeah, It, there yeah, you it go. really works. So, you know, if you have a restaurant and you want to learn how to, to, to turn your meal ketogenic, get in touch with Carl. Because uh, we can help with that. Or if that. you're in Australia, get in touch with Richard. Dudes at 2KetoDudes.com. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to roll an interview that you did with Sam Feltham uh, in England, right? Yeah, in his home. Actually, we were in uh, Europe just recently, Carl and I, and yeah. I had an opportunity to go visit Sam. And Sam is, uh, well, I'll, I'll let Sam explain who he is. But uh, essentially, he did this interesting experiment. And let's see how that went. Okay. Hello again. I'm actually in sunny England um, <laughs> at the house of Sam Feltham. And uh, Sam uh, is a well-known guy in the, in the ketogenic slash low-carb world. He came to everybody's attention with a podcast that he used to do, which was Smash the Fat. Is that right, Sam? That's right. Yeah, yeah. smash the fat, and you get everybody to say, "Smash the fat!" Oh, smash it out! Smash it out! Yeah, was the was the phrase? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was good fun. We can we can do that at the end if you want. <laughs> we can do a smash it out. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. So, and and you did a you did an interesting experiment where you ate different foods for a month to see what effect it would have. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of these experiments, you ate a lot of calories. Right, it was five thousand calories a day. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah and it was all all, it was a, it was a really high fat. It was high fat, low carb. Yeah. Um, so uh, this was, gosh, it'd be about 2013 now, so mm-hmm. five years ago. Um, so what I did is that um, I was trying to think of a way where you can demonstrate that not all calories 
are created equal when they enter the human body. Right. Um, and kind of the only way that I could do that mm -hmm. as somebody that's kind of, you know, always been naturally slim uh, is to try and put on weight. Oh, you're, a fit, you're a personal trainer, right? Yeah, or yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I was mm -hmm. a personal trainer and uh, I've always been a sporty guy. Mm. Um, so I've, I've always been kind of, you know, naturally slim, I mm -hmm. guess. Yeah. Um, so the only way that I could try and demonstrate that not all calories and are created equal when they eat, enter the, the human body um, is to try and put on weight. Mm -hmm. So I decided to essentially overeat by twice the amount of calories that I normally eat. Okay. Um, and I had this plan in my head where I'd do three different diets mm -hmm. um, for, for three weeks each, but with three months in between each of those self-experiments. To wash out. Yeah, yeah, to wash out mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, biochemically reset, so yeah. to speak. Nice. Um, so the first one was low-carb mm -hmm. real food, mm -hmm. uh, which is essentially my normal diet. Um, and so on that diet, I... Um, was eating just shy of 6,000 calories a day. <gasps> wow. Basically. And did you change yeah. your exercise much? No, no, okay. no. My exercise was essentially the same. Mm. Um, and it was the same in each of the, each of the experiments. Um, which is kind of, I do, I did about two hours of, of commuting cycling, mm -hmm. um, a week and then, uh, a few, uh, high intensity interval training sessions sure. a week as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and so my exercise was exactly the same in each one um and uh over those three weeks um i uh after kind of taking into account the protein thermogenic effect mm -hmm. and the loss of fiber and exercise as well sure um i basically overate by just over forty-seven thousand calories mm -hmm. in three weeks so you should have put on a pound and a half Oh, oh, easy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so, according to the calorie formula, right. um, I should have put on 6.1 kilograms. Oh, okay. Well, oh, right. right. So, how much, how much did you overeat? Oh, so 47,000 calories. Gotcha. Okay. So, yeah, I, yeah. I overate yeah. okay. by 47,000 yeah. calories. I according. 4, yeah, okay. Yeah, Good. yeah. 47,000 yeah. uh, calories according to the calorie mm -hmm. formula. Um, and according to the calorie formula, I should have put on 6.1 kilograms sure. um and uh, in actual fact i put on just 1.3 kilos mm -hmm. um but actually lost three centimeters from my waist so you became more dense so quite possibly most yeah. likely putting on muscle instead of uh, yeah it's definitely possible yeah um because i i, I did do a um a bod pod measurement and essentially kind of my uh my my body fat stayed the same mm. Okay. Um, so it's quite possible that I did Must put on some muscle. Issue, yeah. um, and uh, so I, that was the first experiment. Mm. Three months after, I decided to do low fat fake food. Okay. Um, so kind of, you know, standard Western yeah. diet, essentially. Mm. Um, you know, skimmed milk and, mm, uh, <laughs> and cereal for breakfast. Yeah. I know. It was, it was yeah. like having water. Yeah. It was just, you know, yeah. white water. What yeah. is that? <laughs> um, anyway, um, and kind of, you know, low fat pizzas mm. and, uh, oh. what else was it? It was like, um, Nasty. Ch yeah, chicken sandwiches, um, like dry chicken. You know, no mayonnaise or anything Lean like that. chicken. Root. Yeah, and then like zero fat yogurt uh, for desserts and right. stuff like that. Anyway, um, so o o over the a period of three weeks, mm -hmm. um, again, taking into account protein thermogenic effect, loss mm -hmm. of fiber, exercise, I overate by just over 47,000 calories. And yes. kind of looking at the hard math, yep. um, it's actually kind of a difference. I think it was about 53 calories. Uh, that was pretty Pretty accurate. Like, yeah. it's fairly accurate, <laughs> yeah. like, in terms of the difference. Um, and again, according to the calorie formula, I should have put on 6.1 kilograms. Yes. However, I put on 7.1 kilograms <gasps> over those three weeks. Wow. Were the, were the, the weeks prior to doing this, you were on yeah. a low-carb diet? Yep. Yeah, just on my regular right. low-carb diet yeah. and everything. Um, so and the then, difference is water there as well. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So water would, would, would be taken into, into effect there too. Um, and then <laughs> also on my uh, belly, mm -hmm. I put on nine and a quarter centimetres on my waist as well. And you did photographs of this too. Oh, yes. I've seen yeah, them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is this is still all on the on my yeah, old yeah, blog. Obvious, yeah. uh, which which is which I've still got up live mm. um, just so that everybody can still see it. Mm. Um, and I did daily YouTube uh, diaries 
yeah. as well on this and the YouTube channel is still up there smash the fat you can just google that it will come up nice <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, so yeah that was just so that was mind that was low fat fake me. food yep and th- yeah. so what was, what was the third arm of the experiment so third arm um, was very low fat mm-hmm. vegan oh no right okay. um, so uh, yeah I'd, I mean I'd never you know done a vegan diet or anything like that before so I, I was actually quite Mm. you know tentative about this yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, because you yeah. know I, I i know kind of you know what happens kind of if you do go on a vegan diet and you don't supplement correctly mm. um then you know you can become fairly nutrient deficient but um over those three weeks again taking into account protein thermogenic effect, loss of fiber and exercise, sure. um, I overate by just under 40,000 calories. Mm-hmm. So actually 7,000 calories less yes. than the two previous. The two previous. Yeah. Um, and the reason for that was because of the amount of fiber that I was eating. Mm, yeah. So um, the, It's hard to get energy on a vegan diet. Yeah, it, you know, that, it is. That's the thing. I mean, it if you're, is. you're talking about uh, 6,000 calories a day oh, yeah. of yeah. a vegan diet, you have yeah. to be chewing all the time. Oh yeah, yeah. I, d- I did feel feel like a ruminant. Yeah, um, it was, it was, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, and it, the the sheer volume of it mm. was a lot. Mm. You know, um, so I really did struggle on that one to actually mm. kind of fit everything in really sure. um and the reason that uh there was a lot less well seven thousand calories less mm-hmm. um was because of the fiber um so uh recommended daily amount is 30 grams of fiber um yeah. however i was eating 175 grams of fiber a day wow right um so it's a lot yeah um and yeah my body hated me for those three weeks and so did my wife (laughs) um (laughs) but um what do you call it so um yeah what was interesting with this one is that the calorie formula um said that i should have put on 5.2 kilograms right uh but i put on 4.7 kilograms mm. so just under mm. um but I, I put on seven and three quarter centimeters around my waist right um which again for a guy that's always been naturally slim is a lot that would have been shocking um, yeah 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 and what, what's really interesting is kind of the the other things that happened to my body during these three experiments mm. so on the um on the low carb experiment mm-hmm. um i just felt really energetic yeah just and it, like I had energy. That's to burn. a common experience of everyone you know, on a low yeah, carb diet. Yeah. Exactly, mm. um, and because I'd been on a low carb diet before that, like if you just if you up the amount of food that you have and you you're kind of fat adapted and everything like, you, like, you just got you got energy yeah. and yeah. stuff like that. Exactly. You know, um, and then uh, for the second one, the low fat fake food mm. experiment, um, I just felt you know lethargic my mm-hmm. sleep was very broken mm. um and i started snoring ah yeah. I, I never snore well, <laughs> wow. basically yeah. um so uh, that was really really surprising mm. um and and i got those those mid-afternoon slumps yeah yeah the three o'clock I, I, I haven't <laughs> had that ever since i started yeah. eating real food yeah. basically so that was really really bad um and then for the last one um i found myself uh out of breath uh, in, during the vegan one, during the vegan one, wow! So yeah, so lacking um, energy is that? Or yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I also felt lethargic mm. on that too, mm. um, as well as kind of feeling out of breath, even on my um, my cycle commute, mm. um, and you know never get out of breath on a cycle community it's a leisurely cycle yeah, it's not yeah. it's not you know a, a the, high intensity interval out. training yeah, exactly. exactly it's just yeah. kind of plodding along yeah, and things sure. like that but i was getting out of breath because i mean i used to have uh, mild asthma mm. in my younger years mm-hmm. and when i moved to a low carb real food diet all of those symptoms went away right basically um and so having those symptoms return and mm. I, I did have this on the low fat fake food experiment as well mm. um it was just oh, it was so like frustrating and felt so limiting um and uh yeah yeah i was really really surprised with with all those kind of side effects that that came with it wow so so i i have a similar experience in that i i, I went vegan for a month and it, the only reason i did this was because we have a lot of listeners who are indian or or for some reason they have cultural requirements to, mm-hmm. to, to eat vegan vegan diets and so i wanted to just walk them walk a mile in their shoes just for a little bit and so i i I went vegan but i made the condition that 
the only way I would go vegan for October is that if I could be carnival for November. <laughs> so that was the deal. So <laughs> it evens out. It evens out. So I'm currently in the carnival phase. Right. Um, uh, but uh, I I didn't go entirely vegan. I was over lacto. It was a, I called okay. it I called it over yeah. lactober. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah. because I because I I. I I didn't think I could get enough fat from from purely vegan foods, and it, dairy provides a lot of um, it provides extra sources of protein, extra sources of yeah. fat, and of course eggs, egg yolks are you know, nutritional wonder houses. So for sure, yeah. You know, so so, but but I had it. I I actually enjoyed I enjoyed the experience so much that I mm. think I'm probably gonna. I'm probably going to add into my regular cycle of eating uh, maybe a meal every now every couple of weeks of a vegetarian meal. I, I, sure. I didn't find vegetarian bad as long as I could maintain ketogenic vegetarian, as in uh, yeah. you know, not enough, not a lot of carbohydrates. Yeah. But you know that the, the the low fat, high carb vegan that would have been difficult. I can oh, imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 really, yeah. really difficult. So, so um, now y- your you were young and fit and slim, mm. so presumably your body doesn't doesn't really like putting on fat, or it's not it's not a it's not a superstar putting on fat. No, that's one thing. <laughs> and I suspect your 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 basal insulin can get really low when you don't mm. eat a stimulate stimulating food. Your insulin drops, and mm-hmm. mine mine probably wouldn't. My my fasting insulin's like twenty three point seven. It's just right. ridiculous. So, yeah. um, uh, so I probably couldn't I probably couldn't get away with six thousand calories. Mm. But I can certain I certainly know when um, when I eat to satiety, I have a- ample energy to do whatever I want to do, and yeah. and I, I I I don't get cold in my fingertips. All those symptoms of running out of energy i don't get any of that Mm -hmm. and and my hunger seems to be in control but when i go on when i because i was type 2 diabetic when i go on a any of these high carb diets i derange really quickly and so you know that uh, so so your experience there of being lethargic and 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 the like i actually get i get if i eat a, a high carb diet i get lethargic i also get hungry and also i'm overweight which is like a paradox that you know mm. it's only explainable when you when you you look at the hormonal model you know oh, yeah, yeah definitely and yeah what was interesting going back to the experiments is a the the low fat fake food one mm. i i could have eaten more you hung- yes you know yeah, yes. Um, even though i was <laughs> yeah. eating just shy of 6000 calories and you were still limited i could have still <laughs> kept going you know on the on on the two others on the on the low carb real food and the very low fat vegan mm. diet um i was stuffed yeah the entire time yeah you know i was really having to hammer down the food you yeah. know i was like up until you know 11 o'clock trying to finish the 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 last bit of food for the day oh, <laughs> <You> no <know? laughs> i can imagine and then having yeah. to go straight to bed and stuff but yeah um yeah on the on the low fat fake food one i could have just kept going it's incredible Easy. yeah, yeah. so so Moving forward, I mean, what was the response from people to mm. that? Because that flies in the face of of, of all our, all of our dogma. Yep. I mean, you've literally falsified the calories in, calories out uh, hypothesis. Yeah, uh, essentially. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, obviously very supportive um, kind of uh, comments from the, the low-carb community and the real food yeah. Um, most of the real so community at large, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and mm-hmm. paleo community, of course, um, and then from the the regular cal- calorie counters, mm. um, trying to either pick quote unquote pick holes in it. So one of the one of the main things was because on the on the low carb experiment, I was eating like about like half of the diet was nuts. Oh. Right. Yeah. Um, and so uh, their contention was that, you know, you lose calories from eating nuts, not just from the fiber or like protein thermogenic effect, mm-hmm. but like, you know, almonds, I think it can be up to 30% of the calories can be lost. But then that in itself is proof that the calories in calories <laughs> out formula isn't yeah. um, kind of isn't exactly true when it comes to sure. human biochemistry, right? So, um, you know, if that is the case, and it is the case to a certain extent, mm. then we should be recommending people to eat, you know, nuts. Mm. 
as well you know um so you know why not um <laughs> so that was one point that that some people and i continue continue to see this on twitter yeah as well i don't, I don't engage too much with twitter anymore i don't I, either it's a, it's a broadcast only medium yeah for exactly me. <laughs> boom yeah. that's what i do it's yeah. a notice board yeah. and i just walk yeah. away yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Drop a bomb and walk exactly, away. exactly. Yeah. um but i do see it in my notification feed yeah. you know like my name pops up yeah. and somebody yeah. some like some action. troll is saying that this than the other um the, the other thing of course is that you know i it's a fake and i didn't do these things um i mean the only way it, is that you know i wouldn't fake it um, you had a sequence I'm of a, shirtless photographs how does yes, somebody propose well, to fake that i mean <laughs> i tried to i tried to document it as much as i could say so as i as i said before there's a daily youtube video where i was doing it um and kind of the graphs and everything mm. like that and you know i was filming the the weigh-ins and stuff like that so you know it couldn't really be faked yeah no. um and then you know my wife is my is my eyewitness mm, yeah, <laughs> um, to course. that yeah. um, and I like to think that I'm a, I'm a trustworthy guy and just kind of my, my word my bond mm. um, so there's that um, then the other thing is that actually when you do look at the science mm. there is actually some good um, reliable experiments that have been done that kind of prove this so yeah. um, Claude Bouchard mm -hmm. the Canadian French Canadian uh, scientist who's done um, who did a couple of metabolic ward studies with twins, which is the best thing that you could probably do. Sure. Right. Um, and so what he did, he did one experiment where they were for over a hundred days. They, they overate by a thousand calories right. and the weight gain varied from, I think it was about four kilos to uh, eight kilos, hmm. I think. Um, and then uh, he did, a, the same one but under eating by a thousand calories um a day for a hundred days and again there's a range of like a, a loss of i think 1.5 to maybe 11 kilos off the top of my head but the point is is that even though you're putting people in the same calorie surplus and same calorie deficit there are wild variations in how people react to those exactly. things so you know the the metabolic ward studies are there to support the fact that you know the the sim simplistic idea of calories in calories out in terms of the human body isn't exactly true when it comes to weight gain and weight loss indeed you know it's just um you do have to look at it hormonally well you, you, um, in your case you, you 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 go from one extreme to the other when given different signals based on the food yeah and and it, you could probably do that experiment again although i bet you don't want to <laughs> yeah no. but somebody um, else but could, somebody else could it could, yeah, it could be reproduced yeah and this is the other thing so mm -hmm. to anybody that is skeptical about kind of you know what i'm saying do it yourself and mm. see what happens. You know, that's what I encourage people to do. Um, and you'll find out for yourself mm. what, what happens to your body. I, I went on a low carb diet and I lost 50 kilograms. I went from a hundred and, well, I lost 46 kilograms to be precise, but I round up. Mm. Uh, I, but I went from 149 kilograms to 103 kilograms and then, and that was on an ad libitum diet. Yeah. That's, that, that is theoretically impossible mm -hmm. if, if you follow the calories in, calories out model. And then I remained on an ad libitum diet and I didn't gain it all back. Yep. And now four years later, I think currently I'm 106. Right. So, I, okay, I gained three kilograms back. Oh, yeah. woe is me. I'm also <laughs> non-diabetic <laughs> and I have 10 toes. So, you know, awesome, I'm taking man. a victory lap. Awesome. But, you know, the thing is that it's the, the, the calories in, calories out model, if you eat ad libitum, eat till you're satiated, yeah. in theory, I mean, if you follow the calories in, calories out model, you, you need to restrict to maintain your body weight. Yeah. And, you know, that's... Not necessary, which is yeah, totally. And then one, one one thing that um, I don't often explain on on, on mm -hmm. podcasts is that on the um, on the second experiment, um, I did do kind of like a experiment two B, okay, um, which is on the blog mm -hmm. and things um, and on YouTube. Um, so uh, immediately following on from those three weeks of of low fat fake food, mm. um, I, I did go back onto low carb real food uh, but what I did is that I tried to eat at calorie maintenance so the idea was that you know I I put on 
this 7.1 kilos you tried to keep it and i tried to keep it right right eating but eating life eating Eating low carb carb, but (laughs) eating at calorie maintenance so i was eating three and a half thousand calories a day right um and and i'd adjust it Mm. um with kind of macadamia nuts because that was like the easiest thing like in terms of like i'd calculate every day kind of bmi you were using the harris benedict equation and things like that and trying to like keep it at calorie maintenance Mm. and um i did stay at calorie maintenance so in theory i should have stayed exactly the same mm. for, for those following three weeks but i lost 6.1 kilograms in those yeah. three weeks so i was one kilo back shy, to baseline, pretty much. but i was basically back to baseline eating at quote-unquote calorie maintenance just goes to show you the homeostasis wants what the homeostasis wants you yeah know? totally and if you if you give it what it what it needs mm. then it will sort itself out yeah well it needs not to be deranged you yes know? So yeah, that's yeah definitely so, so so after that i saw you did a kickstarter to uh start a program where this was the beginning of the phc it was just yeah. you really wasn't it and yeah. it was like you know thank you thank you very much everyone for your support but i think i'm going to go pro i'm going to mm. give up working as a as a personal trainer i'm going to do this i'm going to be an advocate for a low carb living yeah as a full time job, and mm-hmm. I think you were the, like one of the first to do that. This is this is. I mean, Nina Teicholz is now doing it in America, mm-hmm. and she has a group doing that. And I think there's a group happening in Australia, and a group in Canada, and, and yeah. a, another group in America. So th- th- this is now starting to become a regular thing. But you were the first. So tell me how that uh, experience happened. Yeah. So it was the end of 2015. Um, I just kind of got to the end of my tether with the sheer number of clients that were coming to to my fitness boot camps and we'd have to re-educate them Mm. on you know what it is to be healthy and how you go about doing that um because you know we'd be talking about you know getting rid of grains and things like that when you know their doctor is maybe telling them to eat have a meal quote, unquote, healthy whole grains <laughs> yeah. um and uh yeah obviously it'd fly in the in the face of that and so what i decided is that you know the only way that we're truly going to stop this uphill battle is by setting up a non-profit organization that would advocate real food lifestyle interventions for lifestyle diseases right um you think that that would be kind of the first port of call (laughs) (laughs) for any any public health (laughs) organization but uh not necessarily so um and so um i pitched this idea to everybody that's on our scientific advisory board Mm -hmm. at the end of 2015 managed to get them you know um on on board and then it was february 2016 we ran an online crowdfunding campaign doubled our target um and then it just kind of went from strength to strength from there basically um and and our our mission is really to inform and implement healthier decisions for better public health that's kind of the vague mission statement that we've got but it's kind of you know it's it's worthy and it's flexible enough in that that's a great mission but how do you go about doing that Mm -hmm. i mean the idea is to not necessarily scare people off with kind of the um the ideas that uh well the evidence that we know that you know for instance saturated fat doesn't cause heart disease like if you say that to some people straight off the bat and they just run the other way essentially but if you kind of have this uh this ish vague (laughs) um uh, altruistic sounding uh Mm -hmm. mission statement then you know it appeals to people and you kind of lead them you know in a way um to to actually understand to, be receptive, under, to, to yeah. be receptive and understand how we got into this position um and what the state of the evidence actually is and how we can move forward um and improve things for the better so um we we do that in several ways so uh we try uh, a top down model in mm-hmm. that we try to get in touch with you know influential people um right prime example for us at the moment is tom watson mm-hmm. who's a deputy yeah. leader of the labor party which is the largest political party in the uk not currently in government um however they're the shadow government so um you know they still have a lot of a lot of power and you know who certainly knows what happens yeah. oh certainly mm. influence and who knows what's going to happen in the next general election um but uh yeah so tom watson is a great advocate um for for what we're trying to to achieve um and he's helping out a lot um 
and it, the reason is is because he lost a lot of weight and put his type 2 diabetes into remission like yourself it's incredible. you know basically doing the same thing yeah. you know um, and so he's he's a big advocate for this and and that's one of the best ways that you can try and connect with um influential people is by trying them trying to get them to implement these lifestyle interventions so that they can experience it themselves and realize oh maybe the emperor isn't wearing any clothes most doctors that i know that do low carb mm. do so having done it themselves first and yeah. just about every single one it was the personal epiphany mm -hmm. that 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 drove the change in thinking and the, and and you know it became a and they became advocates themselves so yeah it's it's definitely useful so uh so you've got uh, uh tom watson it, it, so you Political, you've got political movement. How about in the medical industry? How about the medical yeah, field? Yeah, so we are starting to um, see movement there mm -hmm. um, and we're getting um, more and more people that are in positions of power within the NHS and and kind of associated um, associations as well, such as the Royal College of General Practitioners. Okay. Um, so David Unwin, mm -hmm. um, GP from uh from up north um he uh, a few months ago published a um uh, e-learning module for healthcare professionals in the nhs about um diet and type 2 diabetes um and so that's available to everybody um working within the nhs and i believe that you can actually get access to that even as a member of the public um, right. by going to the rcgp website um and so we're starting to um see changes in those types of organizations um which is amazing um because you know it kind of you know gives us a, a massive amount of credibility and and also kind of confirmation that what we're doing actually it it makes a lot of sense yeah <laughs> um, and it, and it and the reason that they're they're starting to accept it in the face of kind of you know still there being contradictory guidelines there um in place is that it works mm. you know it's just it's you can't ignore it anymore no. um well so sort of uh, up until a year ago uh, it was just deemed that diabetes was a progressive disease. Yeah. And I think the, the Zurich conference is when mm -hmm. there were first, the, the first, hit, I mean, Roy Taylor has been and, and Michael Lean have been, yeah. have been in this field as well. Yeah. In a difference, they're sort of in the calorie restriction part of it, but they mm -hmm. certainly have proven that they can reverse diabetes. So exactly. that's like the first chink in the armor. And then Professor Finney and Sarah Holberg with their Verda study yeah. have reversed diabetes in a, in a large cohort of people, yep. uh, it was a controlled uh, out. It was a controlled outpatient trial mm. uh, using uh, using a, a, a web app, uh, using an application on a phone, yep. and so um, you know. And they were show, they were able to show that a ketogenic diet was able to to re take it. Ninety percent of people off insulin. That's never no, been amazing. seen before, you know. Yeah, so, exactly. so it's it's always been the problem for a type two diabetic. You go to your doctor, and your doctor doesn't want to talk about diet. Mm -hmm. Wants to talk about um, "Quote unquote" medical interventions, which by which they mean surgical and, and yeah. pharmaceutical, um, and they want to refer you to a professional to talk about diet. Mm. And when you go to a professional to talk about diet, in my case, I I wanted to try a low carb diet, and I was told not to, and not to tell anybody else in group that I was thinking about it, um, or I'd be kicked out of group. And I wow. said, I'll, I'll make that decision for you right now. And I walked out the door, and then never came back. Good so man. yeah, well, so, well, you know that uh, it, it, I'm one of the one of my roles as an advocate is to try and make sure that diabetics, when they meet their healthcare professionals mm. have the option at least you know have it on the table which is you know. yeah 100 percent. and that, that's something that uh david unwin is is actually advocating for is that when somebody is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes that they, they are given the choice of either um medication or a lifestyle intervention but when it comes to the medication that the patient gives the doctor or healthcare professional um, consent to put them on lifelong medication. So there should be consent there yeah. from the patient, just like you give consent for, for surgery or anything like that. There should be like, you know, um, verbal and like probably um, signed mm. um, consent that 
you're allowing them to put you on lifelong medication. Um, I think that's kind of going to, and that's something that we, we're going to be advocating for in the future. Um, and, that, and I think that might have a big impact on people's decisions. Yeah. Um, because like thinking, okay, I'm going to be on this medication for the rest of my life. Mm. That's actually quite a big thing. Um, maybe I should try the lifestyle intervention first. Yeah. yeah. I think people also need to know what the projected outcomes are as well. Yeah. I mean, yep. the, if you're on life lifestyle medi medication, then mm -hmm. every evidence shows us that you end up with more medication as yes. time goes on yeah, because it just gets, because worse, it gets and worse. worse. And so what the, the, the task of medication is to try and slow the progression as much as possible. Yeah. If somebody, if a patient is given the option of that or a lifestyle, med a lifestyle modification that could potentially reverse the, the symptoms of the disease, mm. reverse and even reverse the progress of the disease and potentially even, should we say, cure diabetes, we'll get there at some point, then I suspect that a lot of them will give it a go at least, see, if it, see what it's like. And exactly. We find that telling people how delicious ketogenic food is yeah. is one of the things that helps a, an obese diabetic mm -hmm. think, you know, this may be not so bad. If yeah, I can eat bacon I and eggs and I can eat steak, <laughs> I'm okay with Definitely. that. I, I, I like pizza, mm -hmm. but, you know, I'm willing to just eat the top. And, yeah, you know, that's, exactly. That'll do. Yeah, and if I, go, I can go to McDonald's, but I'll get rid of the bun and yeah, the special exactly. sauce and just eat the meat. Exactly. You know, that'll do. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, that's, that's really interesting, actually. So there's a, there's a GP... Um, in Liverpool, mm -hmm. um, who works with one of our ambassadors, mm -hmm. which we'll get into, which is our bottom yeah. up, um, approach. Um, and his approach is that, you know, he doesn't necessarily talk like initially, he doesn't talk about the fact that it's a low carb diet. What he does, he kind of invites them to a night of food tasting. Mm. Right, um, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So he invites them to this food tasting evening about the types of foods that you're going to eat on this uh, lifestyle intervention, and it's a low carb diet, mm. you know. But when the the patients kind of taste this food and realise how you know um, tasty it is and how satisfying yeah. it is oh, actually, this isn't so bad. Mm. Um, and in fact, it's actually more enjoyable. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's another approach as yeah. well. You know, just get people to a food tasting and then they'll realise, hmm, actually, this is a pretty good approach. Yeah. So tell me about this ambassador approach, mm. the bottom-up. Yeah, so our bottom-up approach is um, our ambassadors program, which is, a, which is a, a group of volunteers that we've got and we've got 130 across the UK mm. um, in different locations from uh, from Newquay, which is in Cornwall, the most okay. southerly point mm -hmm. of uh, of uh, the UK, uh, all the way up to Aberdeen, up right. in Scotland. Sure. You know? um, and uh, their role is to be local representatives of the PHC, and they physically go to GP practices and inform them about the PHC, uh, why we do what we do, uh, what we do, and then how we can help them mm. as well. And one of the biggest ways that we try to help them is by setting up free public monthly meetings for patients and the wider public to attend so that the healthcare professionals can deliver these Re this real food information to yeah. them they can understand the basics um so that in their um individual and small group appointments the healthcare professionals can get to specifics about medication reduction and things like that quicker um and for specific situations such as you know if you do have religious um dietary requirements then yeah. you know you need to kind of take that into into account and things like that um but then also it's a, it's a place for patient success stories to present to other patients to inspire them yeah um and and show them that this is possible and give them that hope that that is needed um and and also just creating this supportive and motivating environment for for people to flourish with this stuff because it always amazes me that Low carb real food um, and real food lifestyle interventions, full stop, uh, are still successful in the face of all of the corporate budgets in the world yeah. <laughs> fighting against it. You yeah. know, it still is succeeding. And the reason is, is because it's, 
it works um and you know uh people are just so passionate about when you think getting this information out to you're people. up against nestle you're up against coca-cola you're up oh, against yeah. pfizer oh uh, yeah <laughs> this is incredible oh uh, yeah i mean I, I i bet our our annual income is is probably I don't know, 1% of the CEO's salary or something stupid like yeah. that, probably, or, yeah. or like even less. Even you less. Know, like probably 0.1%. Sorry. Sorry, or something. Probably it's probably less. 0.1%. <laughs> um, I don't yeah. know, but it's, you know, it's ridiculous that, you know, despite the fact that we are up against these, uh, you know, huge, huge companies, um, this stuff is still increasing year on year in terms of its support. Um, and this grassroots, movement it's it's unstoppable um and the whole point of the phc is to try and uh structure it and organize it so that the change comes about quicker yeah essentially um and you know all, all, all of the stuff that we do we do it for free um mm. and uh you know hopefully in in the coming decade um particularly in the uk because we do have this one healthcare system the nhs we can bring about change quicker yes you know i'm um, in america because it's privatized and it's fragmented and things like that you've got lots of moving parts and yeah. things but with the nhs because we have this uh, for the most part a, a singular organization um that could be changed once it does change then it changes fairly quickly we have the potential so, in australia to do the same yeah. i think uh, the, we have unfortunately we have a very uh, reluctant uh, set of dietitians that are fighting us but yeah. um the, the 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 science will change them <laughs> that yeah. it has to yeah uh, so you know or they will or they will be run over by the by by the reality of of uh of a, a horde of angry diabetics who very much so who have turned around their life and the thing about diabetics is most of us are related to other diabetics and so you change one yeah. you end up changing your family and mm. that now you have five advocates or whatever however yeah. many in the family and and this is a, this is a snowball that just gets bigger and bigger so i appreciate that you what you what you guys are trying to do is one make it happen quicker but also provide some structure so that so mm -hmm. that it happens in an orderly manner and 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 everybody's coming on board so f for example yeah. the physicians can 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 look at david and when's uh e-learning stuff understand from his point of view how it works work with their patients be consulted by your ambassadors and and go to the meetings and uh, you know th this is this is a more organic process than than what happens in countries where people are just you know left to listen to some podcast and learn how to do it you know yeah it's this is much more i i, I approve of this <laughs> this technique as yeah, even as a podcast that's <laughs> great yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um and and that is really really the approach is to try and uh just make sure that we all organize and, and do it orderly mm. um because we we don't want to trip up on the way mm. with all of this because you know it's it's quite easily done but if everybody is kind of you know singing from the same hymn sheet mm. um when they're approaching healthcare professionals and, and that's the thing you know these these ambassadors they go on a training day with myself and i train them and they kind of you know almost like well, they, they keep to a script like in terms of the facts and figures of course they can kind of change it to make it sound more like them but in terms of the facts and figures and and the overall message you know they they, they stick to um and the idea is that so that as we were saying before, you kind of plant seeds, you water slowly, and then, you know, that does grow. You know, if you jump in with both feet straight away, then you're going to scare a lot of healthcare professionals off. But if you start off with, um, did you know that, uh, you know, one of our scientific advisory board members published an e-learning module with the Royal College of General Practitioners, you should you know, uh, do that. It takes 30 minutes, mm. which it does. Um, and then that's a, that's a great starting point, you know, um, rather than kind of, you know, um, bombarding them with, with all sorts of things. So, you know, slowly, slowly catch a monkey. You catch a monkey, yes, <laughs> indeed. So one of the things, speaking of facts and figures, one of the things that you guys did, which I really appreciate, I'd link to people, link to all the time, is the RCT uh, page, mm. which is what you've done is you've listed all the randomized controlled trials that have tested low carb versus low fat diets. Yeah. And, uh, now I don't, I don't know what the current, uh, numbers are, mm -hmm. but essentially what you've done is you've, you've, you've broken these RCTs into four different columns. Uh, ones that, um, that showed that, uh, that a low fat diet was better. 
yeah. statistically better. Yeah. Uh, statistically means that yeah, there is enough enough power in the study to be able to yeah. say A is better than B. And yeah. so yeah, and yeah. she broke them into four columns, ones which, which are low-fat diets are better, ones which low-carb diets are better statistically, and ones where th- they're, they're better but it's not a statistically significant yeah. figure. So – um, <laughs> I think there's like zero still in the in the, right. the low fat diets that are That's statistically right. better than low carb diets when t- oh, yeah. tested in a like for like comparison yeah, in, a, yeah. in an RCT. So I can I can give you the numbers. Mm. So there are, there are 62 randomized controlled trials in total comparing low carb and we're defining low carb as less than 130 grams a day. Um, so the Richard Feynman ones, and, and that includes the very low carb studies, which is the less than 50 grams yeah. of carbs a day. Um, because there are some low carb studies that are out there that are like 40% carbohydrates and things like that. And <laughs> that yeah. just doesn't count. <laughs> no. You know, that is not enough. Um, and so, yeah, the, the official uh, definition is less than 130 grams for low carb. Um, so that's what we use. So that's adequate for the liver to have to make some. Yes, exactly, yeah. to go into gluconeogenesis, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, then you've got um, low fat, mm-hmm. um, and that's less than 35% total calories um, for, for fat. Um, and that's the dietary guidelines in Australia, if I remember right. Yes, it's less right. than 35%. Yes, yeah, yeah. And no, that's fat. the same in the UK. Um, I think actually in America it's less than 30. Um, but Incredible. Hey. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's America for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, so those are the two definitions, and there are 62 RCTs in total. And of those 62 RCTs, low carb, um, has 53 that are greater in weight loss. Mm. Uh, there are two that are equal in weight loss. And then there are seven that are greater in weight loss for low fat. Right. Um, but that includes non-statistical uh, greater than weight mm-hmm. loss. Yes. Um, and so when you look at the statistical um, s- statistically significant weight loss, mm-hmm. um, which means that there's a cause and effect there. It yes. didn't happen just by chance. Mm. Um, so of those 53, 31 are statistically significant uh, for low carb and again, zero <laughs> for low fat. Right. So, you know, um, in, in the most reliable nutrition science we have available, um, low fat has never significantly outperformed low carb, but low carb has statistically um, significantly outperformed low fat 31 times. So essentially it's like 30, 31 nil and 31 draws. Yeah. Essentially. Um, but you know, if, if, if this was a sports team, mm. right? You'd be you, changing, you, changing you, you your know allegiance. What the, you know what the, <laughs> the, the, uh, the bookies would be doing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's two to one on low yeah. carb and yeah. it's, you know, yeah. <laughs> like 500 to one on low fat. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, you know, statistically, you're just more likely to, to, to lose more weight on low carb. And when you delve into the, um, into kind of the nuances of it all and you look at just rcts with um with type 2 di- diabetes participants so there are 18 okay in total mm-hmm. right um and uh 15 of those show greater hba1c reductions for low carb mm-hmm. um and i think it's two for um for low fat and like okay. one's equal. Um, but again, when you look into the statistical significance, 10 of those 15 are statistically significant yeah. for low carb, reducing HbA1c, zero for low fat. Yeah. So, you know, you, you're just more likely to lose more weight and reduce your HbA1c more on a low carb diet compared to a low fat diet. Yeah. It's not saying that it's kind of, you know, the only way to do things you're just more likely to, Hmm. you know, and when you are looking at, you know, uh, large effects of public health, that's what, you know, you have to start with Yeah, really. So it's just, it's playing the probabilities. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just, I just wonder what they did in that study that, uh, the, the low fat diet had a greater reduction in HbA1c. Yeah. I want yeah. to dig into the methods of that study because yes. all the two yeah, studies. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, you know, it is often that, you know, the, the, the low fat 
uh, studies are like you know definitely getting rid of uh, sugar and yeah. refined carbohydrates and yeah. things like that. Um, so there is that and kind of the length of time mm. as well. Um, so you know that's that's the other thing that needs to be taken ac- into account in the real world. Um, but you know, again, we are living in a low fat world. Mm. You know, the majority of people are supporting a low fat diet, you know, from your mother to your, to your doctor. Um, and so if you do say that you want to go on a low carb diet, you're discouraged to do that. But just imagine if we lived in a world where low carb was encouraged mm. and supported, just imagine how successful it would be. Yeah. When that day does come, and I'm then you know, the results are going to be yeah. even better. Yeah. <laughs> so, <you know. laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, what's next for PHC? So we've got we've got a lot on the horizon. Um, we've got a uh, a conference. Um, our annual conference it'll mm-hmm. be our fourth in fact yeah. um, which will be in London mm-hmm. at the Royal College of General Practitioners mm-hmm. again um, and that is on the 11th 12th of May next year um, so if anybody can make it um, that'd be that'd be great from uh, from the audience of two keto dudes mm-hmm. um, and then also uh, we will be having our first Real Food Rocks Festival Nice. next year as well on saturday the 20th of july um and that is in the north of england in the lake district uh near a town called ambleside um and uh you'll be able to find out details of that kind of soon enough but um the, the the idea is to create a family fun day where the focus is uh real food um and fun that's essentially awesome. there's going to be music yeah. there's going to be all sorts you know that, so that's actually the same day that we is it's day one of keto fest and Brilliant. we do the same thing so we'll be doing Great. exactly the same thing in connecticut Amazing. at the same time um, so good. and so that's yeah that that's awesome that is really that's what good. it's about so, yeah, yeah yeah definitely mm. um and uh, i'm i'm really looking forward to that so if you have always wanted to go to keto fest and you're in, you're in the uk mm. and you just can't get over Go to the Real Food Rocks Festival because it's you know, similar kind of experience. Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, the website isn't up yet, but you can follow us on Twitter. I think it's Real Food Rocks UK mm-hmm. um, if, you, if you check that out on Twitter. Excellent. So it's been a pleasure, Sam. Uh, I've been wanting to do this interview ever since. We, we promised once to go skiing in Breckenridge and didn't get a, yeah, a ski day. a shame. And we were going to record and we just didn't get around to it. And so I'm, I'm glad to have finally tracked you down to your home. <laughs> to your home. <laughs> yeah, you had to come to my house. <laughs> exactly. In that's like okay. the north of Hampshire. <laughs> like, it's ridiculous. But it's thanks, Rich. I really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. you say you'll do for a little? Wow, what an interesting guy! And uh, yeah, what uh, it just goes to show you, man, that the the calories in, calories out thing is an observation. It's not a rule. It, well, it's inadequate to explain what's happening. Yeah, it reminds me of that meme that was going around on Facebook that uh, telling a diabetic to eat less and move more is like telling a drowning person to swim more and drown less. <laughs> yeah, that was Gary Fetke, yeah, who, yeah. <laughs> who came up with that meme. Yeah, that was awesome. So true. Mm. Well, great interview. Yeah. And uh, I, guess it, uh, I guess it's time for some, what, what do we call them? Recipes! <laughs> what you got, Cal? Okay. Well, I got to tell you, uh, one thing that I didn't say is that uh, in my How Was Your Week is that I spent an afternoon at Carrie Brown's house because, you know, she oh, lives nice. fairly close by now. Yeah. And I wanted to make keto donuts. Mm. Keto cinnamon donuts. And the reason that I'm doing it for this show is because there's still time for you to do these uh, for Christmas. And that's what I want to do. I, I want snow outside, my kids over, and making donuts. Donuts. Right? Now, Car- Carrie's working on perfecting this, right? That's right. And yeah. here's a huge caveat. This is not the recipe we started with. It's mm-hmm. just one that's highly rated on the internet. Right. So, we're going to replace this recipe with the one that Carrie and I perfected. Um, for one thing... This you fry these donuts in a shallow pan with coconut oil, mm. and what we did is a deep fryer with lard. Mm, lard, yeah, lard, mm-hmm. yeah. So one of the interesting things that happened was I came up short in the lard department, and uh, <laughs> I had to go out to a local butcher and ask if they had any lard. The guy goes in the back. He comes out with a four pound bag of essentially pork fat. Yeah. But it had some skin and some meat. Perfect. And he said, here. 
And I said, how much do I owe? He goes, ah. He pulled it out of his waste bin, didn't he? <laughs> no, no. He says, I have some <laughs> here because the hunters like it or something. Oh, I'm okay. Not sure. So they add it into the sausages probably. So lean meats Maybe. like uh, venison, you need to f- yeah. add extra fat in. So yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So mm. and, and he just gave it to me. So this nice. is a really great- Good man. A really great thing. Just go talk to your butcher. What's going to hurt? You know, yeah. do you have any fat? Give me yeah. some fat. Mm. Especially the fat around the kidneys, the suet. That's the best stuff. That is the best stuff. So we rendered out the fat and we were left with these little crispy bits that oh, we salted and yum. ate while and we were. We nom, were. nom, nom. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So here's here's the recipe that's going to, uh, it, it is highly rated. I haven't made it, but it looks pretty much like everything that you you'd uh, use. In our recipe. Mm-hmm. So this is a placeholder until I until Carrie comes up with a really good recipe, which I'll share. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. So here we go. The donuts are a half a cup of sour cream, mm-hmm. quarter cup of heavy whipping cream, four large eggs, a teaspoon of vanilla, half a cup of coconut flour, quarter teaspoon of nutmeg, uh, a quarter teaspoon of baking soda, and a quarter cup of sweetener. We used allulose. Mm-hmm. And a pinch of salt. Now, one other thing that we added was apple extract. Oh, yeah, because nothing goes better. I know With you cinnamon don't get and this. apple. I don't get it. Cinnamon, <laughs> nutmeg, apples. This is yeah. apple pie. It's Uncle Sam. You know, this is well, what we y- have. Y- you yeah. don't get Vegemite and cheese, so that's no. Fair I, actually, I do. I, <laughs> but you know, not like I get apples and. You're cinnamon. man of the world. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, so the cinnamon coating, you're just going to take a quarter cup of uh, sweetener and a mm-hmm. teaspoon of cinnamon and mix that up. And yeah. you're cooking in a quarter cup of refined coconut oil. So you're going to preheat the oven to 355 Fahrenheit or 180 mm-hmm. Celsius. In a large bowl, you're going to mix the sour cream, whipping cream, eggs, and vanilla, and slowly add the dry ingredients to the wet, mixing thoroughly. Mm-hmm. And uh, you use a donut pan or a muffin tin with scrunched up baking paper in the middle and Mm -hmm. slowly pour enough of the batter to fill three quarters of the mold and put it in the oven for 10 or 15 minutes or until it's firm to the touch on the outside. You want to remove the donuts and let them cool. And you fill the frying pan with the coconut oil and heat it up and fry each donut for about two minutes on each side or until golden brown. And then you uh, place the uh, sweetener and cinnamon together on a plate and roll the donuts in the mixture and enjoy. And there's nothing better on a cold morning with a cup of tea or coffee than uh, than a cinnamon donut. <laughs> nice. And as I said, that's a placeholder. We'll, we'll come back after the new year with a real uh, kitchen-tested version of this. Sure. Great. So that's what I got, buddy. Mm. What do you got? Mine's going to be a short one this week. I, I've got an awesome recipe for next week, but you're going to have to tune into our holiday hangout to hear that one. Nice. So this one is going to be this is this is actually a product I saw in my local store, but it's something I reckon that anyone can make. So if you're in Australia, you can go to Woolworths and you can get Miguel Maestro's provolone fondue. But if ah. you're not from Australia, it, the recipe is really quite simple. What you do is you get a an earthenware dish. And it needs mm. to have a slight lip. And what you're going to do is you're going to put provolone in it. And you can basically, if you can find a, a, a wheel of provolone that's exactly the same size as the dish, you just, you know, chop a, a, a quarter inch um, segment of that, put it in, put it in the bowl. Now you're going to put this pro, uh, earthenware dish uh, in either in the oven for 10 minutes at 220 uh, Celsius, or you're going to put it in the microwave for like two minutes. And okay. what it's going to do is melt the cheese. And you, and because the you have it in an earthenware bowl it retains the heat and so now the cheese and you can basically have it at your table and the cheese stays melted nice and then you can nice. dip you dip things in it so you can dip sort of uh uh, uh cauliflower florets or broccoli florets oh, yeah. or uh, chicken skin or pork Nice. scratchings, all sorts of wonderful <laughs> things in it so that's my recipe it's a simple one this week as i say next week is I'm going to knock it out of the park. So tune in for that episode. (laughs) Awesome. That's a show, buddy. Yeah, of course, if you have anything you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something you don't agree with, some more research that you found to support or refute anything that we've said, send it by email to dudes at 2ketodudes.com or post it on our website. And you can follow us on Twitter, Twitch, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram at 2 Keto Dudes. 
Make sure to use the hashtag 2KetoDudes. And of course, if you want to join the free ketogenic forum, it's forum.2keto.com. And you can have a look around the ketogenic forum without needing to create an account by starting with success.2keto.com. And if useless swag is your fancy, like t-shirts, coffee mugs, and other junk with witty keto sayings on them, (laughs) head over to gear.2keto.com. And if you want a shot at getting some of that swag for free, join the 2 Keto Dudes fan club. You'll be eligible to win something in every show. Go to fanclub.2keto.com. And if you feel like supporting our forums and all the podcasts that we produce, please think about making a monthly pledge on our Patreon page at patreon.2keto.com. You can see all of our podcasts and other videos on YouTube at youtube.2keto.com. And if you haven't already, please go leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. That's how new people get to know about what we do. Two Keto Dudes is brought to you by Two Keto LLC, who strives to support the low-carb community with podcasts and other publications. And my friend, keep calm, keto on, and fast when you can. Yeah, keep calm and keto on, Carl, and try to keto-fy your restaurants. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) keto-fy. All right, we'll see you next time on on Two Keto Keto Dudes. Dudes.